Because I started it in 1988, and look at these fucking drafts of that book. All this is that book, these three shelves, right? And finally, you know, get down on your knees, pray, 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 right? <laughs> that the offer will actually go through. <laughs> the Windhart never published. Windhart drafts, Windhart, Windhart never published. Above all, John Nichols is a writer. 80 books or 90 books, and I published 16 of them. I mean, I have been writing books since I was 16 years old. And most of them and most of the drafts of books that eventually got published were totally unsuccessful. I mean, this typewriter wrote the Malagro Beanfield War. Yes, unbelievable. You know, many people had opinions about why Joe Mon did, Mondragon did what he did. You know, some people said he was a little half pint son of a bitch. Other people said he just wanted uh, huevos rancheros made from Divine Company and we are cojones. <laughs> Some of Nichols' books, such as the New Mexico trilogy, including the Milagro Beanfield War, have been very successful, making him one of the state's best known writers. I wrote many drafts of a novel for about 10 years called An American Child Supreme. And my character's name was Sammy Hauk, and Sammy Hauk would go to endless cocktail parties in New York City. And I would set them up like F. Scott Fitzgerald and The Great Gatsby, you know, with beautiful people in exquisite clothes, you know, sort of on the balcony with the stars overhead and the twinkling lights of Manhattan. Everybody's drinking mimosas or whatever. <laughs> and then. About halfway through the party, my hero would jump on a table and say, All you scumbags, shut up. Everybody shut up. Everybody shut up. And then he would give, and I've got novels. I, I have manuscripts with it. He would give like a 50-page dissertation on the history of, of Western and U.S. imperialism in Southeast Asia from the advent of the French to the Tonkin Gulf Re Resolution in 1964. And you know, the novel would just come to a shuddering, screeching halt, you know, like an engineer putting the brakes on a freight train going 60, right? And then it would just crash. I lived in New York from 1963 to 69, and I was really burned out. I couldn't earn a living. I couldn't pay apartment rent. I, couldn't, I didn't have any place to write except in the study hall at NYU or in the local donut shop around the corner. And, and um, New York was, became fairly alienating to me. You know, moving to New Mexico, I suppose I mellowed out in some way, right? <laughs> Watch the traffic! <laughs> I, and, and probably I would owe that to the people of Taos, the community of Taos, the fact that I became involved in other pursuits besides just ranting. When I was 24, I figured out whether I earned $100,000 a year or $5,000 a year that I would live um, like I was earning five grand a year, and then nobody could ever take my life away from me. And nobody has. It was felt that if being a writer required that I was literally a bum all my life, that I would have done it. You know? Mm -hmm. It's a little miracle that, that, that I was actually allowed to earn a living at it. And I have a huge privilege in that I am not afraid to speak my mind, and that by and large people will not fire me for speaking my mind. Mm -hmm. Although a few years before I became a writer, if I had spoken my mind like I did, mm -hmm. my career would have been destroyed. Uh -huh. So many, in Hollywood, I mean, my God, Hollywood. McCarthy period, yeah. You openly, you know, avow socialist or Marxist politics. I mean, from 1946 or 47 till 1960, that was a great way to get destroyed in this country. And it, you know, and a lot of people get destroyed, but I don't give a fuck. You don't understand. If you don't give a fuck, they can't hurt you. They, you know? If you don't give a fuck, if you wind up in the gutter, they can't hurt you. Don't wear 
Till the sun keeps shining through the driving rain Going where the weather suits my clothes Banking off of the northeast wind I'm sailing on a summer breeze Keeping over the ocean like a storm Ah! Let's go to a more sheltered place. Terrified we're gonna get hit by lightning. It's so nuts, we're gonna die. And it's just a typical fucking day on the Rio Grande. Unbelievable. Everybody's talking at me. Can't hear a word they're saying, only shadow. More echoes on my mind. All the people stop and stare. I can't see their faces, only she goes of their eyes. Going where the sun keeps shining through the driving rain. Going where the weather suits my clothes, like the day on the Rio Grande. <laughs> we tonight! Sailing on a summer breeze. It's a killer occupation, but somebody has to do it. I love my little adventures on Earth, but my little adventures I love are like um, getting soaked in a rainstorm, screwing, reading the newspaper, having a shot of bourbon, uh, growing my sunflowers in the garden. God, someday I'll die down here, and that'll be the fucking end of it. What a way to go. My outlook after undergoing endocarditis, congestive heart failure, open heart surgery, uh, Meniere's disease, oscillopsia, double hernia operations, varicose veins for 25 years, and other assorted attacks upon my body is that any day I get is gravy. And I did not write it. Somebody wrote in the Milagro Beanfield War when Amarante Cordoba gets up in the beginning of the movie. He looks in a mirror and he says, thank you, God, for giving me another day, right? <laughs> and I certainly say that. Skipping over the ocean like a stone. Da, 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 that's all, folks. 